<laughs> okay, welcome. My name is uh, Ashanut, and I'll be your moderator for this session. Again, again. <laughs> okay, wonderful, fantastic to have you. We've got some new faces, lots of smiles, so that's really exciting. So this session is up about the digital what? IDs, IDs and? And we're called a? A coalition, a? A revolution, a? <laughs> Okay, welcome. So this session is really an opportunity for the digital IDs and human rights community to tell you a little bit about what they're doing, to hear from you about what they do, and hopefully you can join this fantastic community, revolution, coalition, togetherness, yeah? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So this um, digital IDs community is global, yeah? We know what global means? Global means? Global? Huh? Over? Global means? Balloon. <laughs> so we've got people from all over the world represented in this coalition, yeah? Okay, let's see. We've got people from South America. Where are you? Woohoo! You see, we have people from North America. Can we hear it? Uh huh. Yeah. Again, again. Woo. <laughs> we have people from Europe in the coalition. Where are they? Yeah. <laughs> We've got people from Asia. Asia. Yeah, that was a very. <laughs> Asia, can we hear you? Yeah. Okay. We've got people from. We have Australia. Yes. Hey. Woo. Okay, and then people from the motherland. Where are you? Hey! <laughs> okay, fantastic. So on our agenda, uh, you have the slide. So on the agenda, we will start with um, really a brief, a brief overview. So we'll have different members tell you about the incredible stuff that this community has been doing. They'll tell you a little bit about the journey. It's been about a year since the last IGF, isn't it? But we've come such a long way. You know, they've got structure. Hmm? They have regular communication. They have focus. They have thematic areas. They have, you're going to wait and hear the rest. OK, so you'll hear about that and some of the activities that they are doing. Then we'll also really like to hear from the rest of you and hear about what are some of the digital ID challenges that you that you're dealing with. Okay, so let's start with a brief overview, background. Let's give it up for Caitlin, for Caitlin. All right, here you go. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Chaffee and I have the very difficult task of following our excellent moderator, Ash Newt. Um, I can promise a drop in energy, so I apologize for that. Um, and I won't do any call and response, but what I've been asked to do is to give a background of our coalition work to tell you a bit how we got here today, why we're here, and why we really want to invite more of you to come join us in the great work that we're doing in advancing digital ID and human rights. So Ashley, it's already told you a little bit about who's in the room, that we're a global coalition. We are civil society organizations, so we are researchers, activists, some of us are unfortunately lawyers as well. Um, we're diverse in our geography, but we're also diverse in the size of organizations that we represent. So we have small community grassroots organizations all the way up to large multinational NGOs, people from universities. Uh, we really run the gamut when it comes to human rights organizations and human rights actors. Um, we're also very diverse in the reasons why we're interested in digital ID. People are approaching it from many different perspectives, bringing many different viewpoints, and we're very diverse as well in our approach to how we come to the work. You know, some of us are researchers, some of us are engaged in advocacy, some of us do lobbying, strategic litigation, you know, we bring a lot of tools to the table when it comes to advancing human rights. And really the reason that we came together is because we have shared concerns about the types of digital ID systems that we're seeing the way digital identity is being formed. And if you look at the timeline, which is the slide that's on the screen right now, you can see that 
In the beginning, we were very reactive. So we saw opportunities to come together for consultations, to do joint research projects, to write things like open letters that shared some of our concerns. Um, but we were really reacting to opportunities that we saw. And over the past few years, I think we've become a much more proactive community. Um, so we become more cohesive. We do have structure now, which is very exciting for all of us. Um, and also, we are trying to be much more forward-looking, to identify opportunities before they come so that we're much more prepared to meet them, to develop shared resources, and also to leverage the strengths of our community uh, to build more inclusive and human rights-focused outcomes. And it's very special for us to be here today at IGF in the first public session uh, to share the work of our coalition, because it was actually at IGF last year in Addis that the coalition really began to take on a formal shape. So that's when we launched our initial volunteer group to start establishing some structures and started to bring what was at the time a very loose coalition of civil society organizations together into something that is much, much, much more organized today. And over the last year, we are in a kind of a piloting phase, a, a building phase, but we've accomplished quite a lot. We've agreed on a shared vision statement for the coalition. So we're a, a powerful coalition that aims to move together to provide solidarity and support and engage in collective action. And we have a beautiful one pager that's on the table here and I'm sure will be shared with some of the folks online as well, um, talking about some of our shared vision. And we also established a structure, which will be the next slide that you'll see here. And at the top of this structure, the thing that is most important to us is our community membership. All of the CSOs and activists that have come together, that is our strength and that is what we build all of our work on. And to bring some shape and structure to that, we establish a coordinating group that's responsible for setting meetings, developing visions to share with the group, uh, setting up things like sharing sessions as well. We have a specific work stream on sharing and learning. So we have, for instance, shared information about strategic litigation that's happening in Uganda for the rest of the coalition to learn and hear about current developments. And we have a lot of other opportunities planned where information and resources will be shared with members of the coalition. We also have a work stream on communication, so improving the way that we share and communicate with one another, but also with the outside world. And perhaps most importantly, we, at the last meeting we had together, identified two priorities for collective action. So one is on multilateral engagement, on bringing the concerns and the information and the expertise of our members into multilateral space, spaces and international organizations. And we also have a piece of collective action on national level advocacy. And I have some wonderful colleagues here who are gonna share a bit more about this work. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Janina, who's gonna talk about some of the needs mapping that we've done. Hey, people, what, is that how you clap? <laughs> is that how you clap? <laughs> clap properly, clap, 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 clap. Thank you, Caitlin. Yes, doesn't that sound exciting? Yeah? What did you like about what Caitlin said? Anything that struck a chord? I hope you're paying attention. Should we ask her to get back again? <laughs> you like the word community, aha, uh -huh. what else did we like? From Caitlin's presentation. Caitlin's presentation. You talk to me, please. Don't be like on Zoom where you hide behind the screens. What did we like about Caitlin? What else did Caitlin say that we liked? Sorry? Proactive. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. You had another point. Any other thing that stood out for us? Okay. All right. So now let's listen to uh, Janaina. She's going to tell us about some one of the initiatives of the coalition of the community. Thank you so okay. much. Welcome. I don't know if everyone here was in Costa Rica during Rightscom, but when you were there, get <laughs> so some of us, yes. Um, but what we did there, we did this exercise, uh, this mapping of our needs and our capabilities. What we tried to do is actually, it's better show where the, um, 
we can influence and we can share knowledge between our members and where we can actually build the capacity, where we need to build this capacity. This is uh, something that uh, Juan's gonna tell just after me. And um, we can want to see how we can find these areas. <laughs> Uh, the coalition members can support each other. So we did one sheet just for the capabilities and distribute another sheet just for the needs. What we ask for our members were the, to populate these cells, whether, for example, which kind of digital governance influence methods they utilize in their organizations, and which kind of human rights and social fields they are most um, build their expertise on it. So we give them uh, these examples, and I think we can show the, the next one. And what we came with all these answers is what we have flourished in the capabilities map, where we are our strengths, where each organization can support each other, like the big ones, the multilateral ones. So here we can see, for example, where some of our members comment. For example, one of our members had like 12 affiliate actors and they produce state policy research outputs. Uh, they are very strong in research fields like discrimination, economic and social rights, privacy and data protection. Uh, other members are like really GDPR experts, they're from lawmaking to enforcement and compliance. We also have experts in using personas, storytelling, and how to reach communities, how to actually raise awareness, uh, raise awareness and how to stoke advocacy. So these are strong suits, and this is how we can support each other, but also, we see where are the, our biggest needs, where we should focus our capacity building, where we can actually construct workshops, being, um, bring more experts actually to help us to capacity building and their needs. So here we see what our members want to learn more about it. For instance, learn about comparative examples. Some of them want more focus on collective actions, alliance for advocacy, and the uh, surveillance fields, transparency and access to information. And this also speaks from our multilateral engagement projects and also the natural legislation project that I'm going to pass through who wants to, to speak and how we share knowledge on these two uh, big fields that you focus on this year. So, so another further ado. Juan, please. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Janaina. <clears throat> As you can see, the, the community is very deliberate, very intentional on trying to make sure that members learn from each other, leverage on each other's strengths, really understand where are the gaps, where are the opportunities, and use that to create opportunities to learn from one another. Not just regionally, not just nationally, but... but all over the world. Can you imagine being part of that? Exciting, yeah? Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, so we're, um, we're now going to listen to um, one of the initiatives that the, the community is working on. There are two thematic groups, one looking at national level mm -hmm. interventions, and then the other one looking at multilateral engagement. So let's give it up for Juan. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to fight against jet lag and keeping such high energy levels. I mean, I'm not going to be able to <laughs> deliver as, as good, but yeah, I'll <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to try and match it. Yeah, that's right. Hold on. Should we try and um, give you energy? No, no, no. I'm, I'm Should fine. Should we I'm try? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Should we try and give you energy? Yes. Let's give him energy. <laughs> Shall we give him energy? You see, we are compassionate. <laughs> Kind, eh, imagine, we are compassionate, we are kind, yeah. we support each other. Yeah, shall we clap? <laughs> clap. <laughs> energy, 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 energy. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, now okay. proceed. Yeah. I'm feeling very capable now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we've got two initiatives that are uh, working groups uh, aimed at, at solving particular problems that we think we can solve for in the coalition. And one of them is the National Legislation Mapping uh, Group. We, this stems also from the RightsCon meeting in which we agreed on, on forming these two groups. And this one, what it's doing is a mapping exercise on the development of uh, ID systems in different countries. Um, one of the reasons we think that's an important task is because uh, the issuing and the, the implementation 
of national ID programs is very different in different parts of the world. And we try and compare uh, those different systems in different places to understand how they're working and to use that knowledge to our advantage in terms of, of advocacy mainly. So um, this was a prioritization, as, as I mentioned, from the, from the Rights Fund Summit. And the idea behind it is that we create a tool that's useful to advocate mainly. We are not a coalition that's uh, focused only on research or on uh, academic work, although we, we're very acad ad academically capable as well. We do think that that's a requirement to build better arguments. Uh, but we're aiming this effort towards something which allows us to move forward our advocacy efforts. Um, and then the methodology, which is uh, maybe one of the stronger points of this uh, exercise as a whole, was uh, collectively developed as well. It's very flexible, uh, but every member of the working group has pitched in with ideas and, and with ways of, of making that methodology very strong, which I think is a, one of the strengths of the group as a whole. Um, so the, the methodology has that uh, advantage, and the other one is that it's easy for newcomers to adapt to it. Uh, so this is, of course, an invitation for all of you to come join us. Uh, but we, we develop it so that uh, any country or any researcher can come in at any point and, and bring their um, specific situation to the table in a, in a manner that uh, allows us to compare the different situations all around the world. Um, so yeah, I think we can show them the, the idea of how we're gonna, oh yeah, First, the categories that we're actually mapping. Uh, for now, it's these five. We, as I mentioned, have a methodology on, on how we're gathering this information in order to make it easy to compare. Um, and, but this is very much uh, still open to discussion. If we see that we need to, to develop more or, or newer um, categories, we, we can do that. Um, and then the, what we are aiming for with the results uh, is something, at least for the first part, that looks like the next slide. <laughs> 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 yeah, something of this sort. So uh, we're trying to develop something that can be hosted in uh, each organization's website so that it doesn't require people to, to navigate to another website in itself, uh, but it, it can be, I mean, it's the same information presented in, in many different uh, places. And we're trying to, uh, for now, just have the, uh, the more narrative version of it displayed, but this is gonna be the building, the stepping stone for, for probably a more quantitative approach towards ID uh, in the future. That, that depends on, on what we're doing. And as you can see, I mean, some countries are already uh, beginning to be blue, but uh, on this side of the map, we still lack some of your help. So if you're willing to join, that would be, that'd be great. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for the National Legislative Group for now. Uh, I guess we can take questions on the methodology and everything on the, on the Q&A. Um, next up, Marianne. <laughs> I have a lot of energy. You have, okay. I have all the energy. <laughs> I have all of the energy that you guys do not have. I stole it. Um, hi, I'm Marianne from Access Now. I am the campaigner for YID, which is our campaign on digital identity. Um, so I was supposed to talk to you. I don't have fun. Um, Phone, phone graphs, I only have this one slide, so I need to have a lot of energy to counteract it. Uh, but this is basically what the multilateral uh, working group has been working on for the past year. We have been working a lot and meeting constantly, so many meetings. Uh, this is not trying to deter you from joining, like you can join the meetings as you wish and as you can, you do not have to be present uh, weekly. Um, but, I mean, yeah, no, but we have the bi-weekly and then we have the working group meeting, so it's, it's a lot. It's just, I'm saying, um, I'm just saying we have worked a lot, that is good. Um, so this is basically uh, our effort to uh, build expertise that is uh, across national context and transnational and global, which are all different things. And 
uh, engaging multilateral forums in a way that is more strategic and coordinated, because we have been doing that, all of us, but separately <laughs> and uncoordinatedly so far. So basically the goal is to ensure that all of the community members that are part of the coalition have uh, the timely information and the insights so that they can engage in processes uh, at an international level, but also to be able to understand which tools and which um, activities and which uh, learning experiences can be developed that integrate uh, the different needs uh, across the, the globe. So that means um, that on the one hand, we this year work on a collective strategy for our members independently to engage with different processes such as uh, the UNGA High Level Week where we had different sorts of participation and different types of meetings and then a debrief session to understand how to work with the knowledge that each of us had acquired throughout the different activities. That also means that we are preparing trainings on uh, technology design and standards and also on how to engage in this fora because for each organization, like we all have different levels of expertise and we all have different uh, approaches to how, how to engage and where to engage. And also the coalition has been funding, providing funding for uh, the presence of, of more members on uh, forums like this one. So a lot of the people who came to this IGF, to the previous IGF, to RightsCon as well, to our, our meeting at RightsCon, where uh, their travel was funded by them. Also, the YAD campaign, ha ha ha, you knew this was coming. Um, the YAD campaign is launching today, <laughs> a effort that we have been working on for an entire year with the community, which was a community effort that many of you were part of at the last RightsCon, providing feedback in our, our zero draft of this. This is a toolkit that I don't know if we have a couple of them still there, but the great part is that now we have a website and everyone can see it on the website. This toolkit aims to help digital rights activists working on digital identification systems to navigate the complexities of this topic in an easier way and to provide them with language that might help them get started in campaigning and mobilizing advocating, educating around digital ID systems. So this is basically a stack of a framework to help us think about digital ID systems, and it came from community effort to understand what the global needs were across different regions. And that is all from me, thank you. Excellent, you see? You live and have cards, you have tools, so many things, yeah? Okay, so um, we've heard from the different presentations. So what I'd just like to give you is three minutes with the person next to you, uh, or three of you. Do you have any questions about the, the community, about the coalition? Is there anything that intrigues you? Um, yeah, I give you three minutes. Three minutes. Just talk to the person next to you. Not to your phone. The phone is not a person. A laptop is not a person. A person is an actual human being. Yes. Uh -uh. Talk to the person next to you, really. Please talk to each other. I beg, I beg, talk to each other. And do you have to like the Digital identity system can also be found so in uh, countries that have many other problems as well. Like the World Bank and others have been pushing it as the solution. Hey people, please put your phone down. Talk to the person next to you. That phone is with you. So we have a national ID. By the way, biometric in Iraq, yeah, so have my national ID this year, which, <laughs> which is very new. Which phone? Sorry, the in the passport, uh, yeah. the biometric just for so passport. Now. Okay, yeah. So, so still, silos? there is no biometric in the foreign area. And the big so question is then you have to be mindful uh, what they Mexico, do with that biometric data. Yeah, I don't know. Like like several several there will be creative uh, appliances in the future. Uh, 
institutions so, that and who is collect doing it? or that provide this kind that of very much the government or the uh, uh, nearest organization uh, the organization, global organizations. Uh, um, so like this, this is a global network of NGOs yes, yes. and we actually and there are um, others like tax authorities we are very others. happy that we but get now to work particularly this, right and, now uh, like it's next I am week or probably next uh, week and, and, to pass a law it's super okay. interesting okay I hope you're you still talking back about back digital back IDs. Back. I come from it's Europe. Like the yeah. Plus the greatest uh, uh, ID for all people in Mexico. And so colleagues in Latin America. We've been like, expecting uh, this yeah. for a long time. It's totally different um, debate. And they have and much more experience. Yeah. So well, well, in, in, in no, in, in Iraq, it's... Uh, uh, we are yet to OK, have like can I have your attention back? No? So they have a biometric which is very new, and uh, at the beginning, uh, most of the countries, they, they rejected. Can I have your attention? To, to have it around the world, and now they accept it. So, for example, if you are in trouble, like, with the new... Can I have your attention, okay. please? For a few months, you cannot. Yes? So, yeah. Okay, what questions do we have? Yeah, what questions do we have? We should come up with questions. What questions do we have? There are no questions. I was hoping for at least no questions for the community. Oh, it's clear? It was perfect? Okay. Okay, let's listen. Hello, 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 everybody. My name is Hugo Cordoba, and I'm here. Uh, I work for the European Parliament. I'm working currently in a legislation to make uh, electronic IDs for your Europe. And my question will be for, for everybody here who wants to answer how, and we know that this digital identities now is going to be more and more provided by different uh, countries, and how this coexistence of these initiatives with the uh, um, national solutions is going to cohabit, and what is the purpose of one and another? How is the relationship? Thank you. Okay. It's a good thing I'm a moderator. Someone from the community will answer that. Do we have any other questions? So we take two or three. Any other questions for the community? Yes. Alicia? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we are just curious about the impressive work and we wanted to know um, how many organizations are in the coalition so far. Um, yeah. How many are we? We are so many. Can you even count? Someone start counting, okay? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Camila from IDEC in Brazil, and my question is, how can we enter the coalition? <laughs> you have to go through me, number one. <laughs> Any other? Um, two questions, yeah. Um, how much does it cost to join? And... Um, why don't you have a better name and acronym? A better name and acronym as compared to? As compared to? We are taking Okay, that's another question. Any other? Those were three? Okay. Hello, I'm Ale from Brazil. I'd like to hear how the coalition have been influencing the uh, multilateral and international organizations such as ID4D and so on. Thank you. Okay. Do we have someone for each of the questions? Can we take any other? Are we ready? Two more, two more points. Are we okay to answer? Okay. No, okay. Yeah. Uh, Armando Mansueta from the Dominican Republic. Uh, just wanted to know if you want, if you are planning to extend the scope of the of the study you've made to other countries as well, especially to other countries in maybe in the same region, the Caribbean, for example. All countries. I don't know all countries. Okay. If that's the case, uh, I have. If that's the case, I have plenty of information that I'm willing to share with you, so you can have uh, from my country, of course. <laughs> Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic. Okay. Does someone want to be the facilitator? I saw you taking up. Okay, great. So let's start with the first question. The first question. 
who's taking the first question? Oh, yeah, Thomas. There you go. And you've got a microphone right in front oh, of you. Oh, yeah, you're right. There you go. And it works. Hello, hello. Um, mm -hmm. So as, well as, as I understood the question, it's about the relationship between these national electronic identity systems, super nationals ones. And I, I mean, we don't know the answer yet, but my strong assumption would be that we see a convergence. There will be international standards. They will be supported by our phones, by the secure hardware elements on that. So sooner or later, there will be a one-size-fits-all solution for at least, let's say, particular regions in the world. And um, my, my fear is that not in all cases these systems will be um, governed democratically and will have privacy by design safeguards that, that make them safe to use, particularly for vulnerable parts of the society. Okay, thank you. Did that answer your your question? Okay, there was a second question. Uh huh. Yes, please add. Yeah, I think I would just add to, to Thomas's answer, and I I don't think I can speak for the entire coalition because I think there is some you know divergence in our views here, and we're not a coalition that has a kind of a set uh, mm -hmm. viewpoint or advocacy position on any given digital ID system. I think because we are such a diverse group. Um, and we have such diverse concerns, but I think from a, an individual perspective, you know, our position of my organization, which is the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, is that you know, each digital ID system, whether it's national or supranational, needs to be based on the principle of necessity. Um, so it really needs to be a stronger understanding of where and why certain ID systems are necessary. And that certainly won't apply to every context in which a digital ID system is currently being implemented. Um, and I think other, also just to emphasize the strength of our coalition is that we have extensive evidence and documentation of the harms that digital ID systems can uh, create and can exacerbate in different contexts. And I think what that has really shown is how important each individual context is, the political context, the economic context, the social context, and that in having an evaluation of how systems should interface, that context needs to be very carefully considered because these are not just technological systems, they are socio-technical systems, and it's very important to situate any kind of analysis about system design, system implementation in the individual context of each country in each region. Mm -hmm. You see that community? I saw people nodding their heads as Caitlin was speaking. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there was another question. What was the other question? There was a question around the number. So you have almost 60 groups. Oh. Almost 60 groups in the coalition now? Yeah. Civil society. Oh. Um, there's a uh, one pager down here at the end with some more information about the community and there's an email address that you can get in touch with and our new communication system that we set up. Um, yeah, or anyone in the room. We're all here to talk to you. Okay, does everyone have the one pager? Who has the one pager? Who doesn't have the one pager? Who doesn't have the one pager? Really, really, please, please pass that one pager. You must get it. Everyone must get that one pager. Is that the one? Uh, uh, there's another one. It's the other one. Horizontal. No, this one behind you. That one. Yes, yes, yes. Please, please, please. They didn't. They didn't answer your 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 question, Peter. Yeah, you had two questions, Peter. They didn't answer the second. They are still thinking about it. They are ruminating, ruminating, ruminating. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yes, Mary. Okay, like I, I don't need that many microphones. Um, so yeah, I don't remember who asked this beautiful question that I get to answer now um, on our engagement in multilateral forums, but, but particularly on ID4D. Um, it has been a bumpy road. Um, is that a like adequate assessment of our relationship with ID4B, a, a bumpy road? Um, but uh, I think that for the last year, it, we, we have had a, a very interesting conversation. It is an ongoing conversation um, that we had uh, both online and later at RightsCon, and it's continuing and it's ongoing, about um, the, there have been some 
misunderstandings, let's say, in how we approach digital identity systems from the space of civil society, which is that we are not uh, in the position of a digital ID is bad necessarily, but that there needs to be a disentanglement between the notion of legal identity as the relationship, uh, the legal relationship between a person and a state, and digital ID being a tool that is used to accomplish that maybe, maybe, but not necessarily. So there is a, an identification there that we are trying to disentangle from a conceptual point of view. And then we are working on getting to about the same page on safeguards and remedy. And so there is an ongoing conversation. That is what I'm going to say about that. And I, I would say that this past year has been very productive for us as a community. And, and, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of ID4D, but I, I, I think that for them as well, they have experts. So, so that's that there. Did I miss something? OK, thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Uh-huh, questions, comments? Yes, ooh, I love. I have a question. I heard, the, I heard a phrase strategizing public interest litigation. I was wondering if you are doing it, and if yes, how? Secondly, if I could join. So please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, let's take it. Hi, everybody. Hello. Uh, there was a question I don't think it has been answered. It was about how uh, the work has influenced um, the way we are working. For instance, let me say what Caitlin was talking about, the issues of um, multinational and national issues. In Kenya, we can give an example. Uh, through the civil societies, Kenya was to launch digital ID in, on 2nd of uh, October. But through this platform and a lot of engagement, they suspended it. And um, through also working together, we've seen countries like Uganda, they want to uh, learn more on how Kenya has worked. We've worked with Adhar uh, from India and also Jamaica. So at least there is a lot of um, issues that is happening. Unlike before, not so many people used to know about the issues of digital identification card. But right now, so many people and the way we are here, there are so many people who are learning a lot from this. So let's keep it on. Let's continue. Let's le make more noise. Uh, thank uh -huh. you. Did you hear that? OK. <laughs> Hi. Um, <clears throat> I, I was wondering, I mean, I think we've been tracking digital identity for, what, five years or more, probably close to 10 now. Um, and it seems like, and maybe I'm wrong, that there's like a, a lot more momentum from a governmental perspective and also from a private sector perspective. Um, kind of that digital identity is going to be, I think it is perceived to be the entry to the digital economy and to digital society. So I'm wondering, over these last years, does the coalition, has the coalition come to a conclusion of what um, digital identity done right might look like? <laughs> and is that possible? Given that, you know, there's just so much pressure from a national perspective and from a private sector perspective to implement this, as we've seen in, you know, Uganda, Tunisia, you name it. Um, can it be done right? Okay. <laughs> uh-huh. Laura, hey, quickly. <laughs> Well, I, um, I did want to mention something about the strategic litigation question down here, which is to say that that was uh, in the heat mapping that we did, that was one of the areas where there was a lot of interest across many different members of the community. So in the sharing and learning piece that we talked about, we're holding a strategic litigation training workshop later this year. Uh, so you should join up now and you can come. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of, that was one of the main interests, I think, uh, that got on people's radar um, within the civil society communities for transnational exchanges, especially. I had one thing I wanted to say about the question on digital ID done right. Um, you know, I think we get that question. I get, I get that question a lot. I think a lot of us get that question a lot. I think it's the wrong question. 
Um, because I think just in a lot of what folks have been saying and responding to other uh, responses, other, other inquiries that have come up, is that things really are contextualized uh, in every single local, national, regional context. And digital ID is never done. It, the, it's, it's the fact that it is implemented and it needs to be monitored and society changes. That's what we mean when we say it's a socio-technical system. It's not done. So it's not done right. It needs frameworks so that we have constant feedback about people who are being excluded, about the way things are going wrong, because they're going to continue to go wrong. Um, so I guess that's in it, thinking about the structures that we put in place around it as human beings. That's how you can get more right. Mm -hmm. And they nod their heads again. Okay. <laughs> Peter, you had something to say about litigation? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I'm Peter from Access Now. Um, we coordinate the Digital Rights Litigators Network. I know there's some fierce advocates in this room, um, some folks in the network, some folks who uh, are not yet in the network, but we're going to meet on Thursday afternoon, 3.30. Um, and I think digital ID is definitely going to be on the agenda. So there, there is an opportunity here for a private meeting on mm -hmm. litigation. Okay. And we need a better acronym too. Okay. We're working on that. I said we are ruminating. We're thinking. We're thinking. We're thinking. Okay. All right. We have a special guest. We have a special guest with us today. We have who? Who do we have? Who do we have, Laura? Who do we have? We have a special guest. Who's the special guest? Right there. Who's the special guest? Who is the special guest? Hey. Yes, we have the UN Secretary General's Tech Envoy here with us. Can we welcome him? Welcome, welcome, welcome. You see, when you hang out with this community, you see the kind of people who come into your spaces, yeah? <laughs> okay, welcome, sir. I'd like to give you an opportunity to say something. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join you. Um, and uh, uh, such an important topic. Uh, the, uh, the interface of, as Laura put it, so socio-technical systems, but I might even add socio-legal technical systems, um, these interfaces are creating opportunities, uh, but they're also creating potential problems, even existing problems. So we need to get them right. Uh, and we are very keen to uh, bring together multi-stakeholder partners uh, to build some safeguards, a framework uh, of safeguards around digital public infrastructure at large. So not just digital ID, but also uh, payment uh, gateways, uh, uh, things that work at the data layer. Uh, there is, because of the G20 discussion, many other developments, uh, great interest in DPIs today. More investments are going to come in. So we have to make sure that these uh, uh, investments don't result in uh, digital public infrastructure, don't result in these socio-legal technical infrastructures. Uh, that violates safety, security, human rights, sustainability considerations, and that lead to exclusion of uh, marginalized uh, uh, groups. So for that, we've launched with UNDP uh, an initiative on DPI safeguards last month, so at a very formative uh, stage. And we would like to invite all of those who are part of this coalition to help us get to that safeguards framework and to help us maintain that uh, like an international standard that people in the civil society uh, can use as a reference, but also those who are investing in DPIs, who are development cooperation partners on the ground, can use as design principles, can use uh, it to inform their decisions, inform uh, their investments. Tomorrow, and this is a plug in C1 at uh, 9.45, Moritz, uh, we will be doing an event uh, with um, uh, UNDP, jointly with UNDP, uh, on this issue. It's the beginning of a conversation, so please help us get this right. 
um, and the insights from uh, Kenya, uh, Uganda, India. So if we can, um, the Caribbean, if we can, Jamaica in particular, we can get those together and put that into a framework that we maintain as a kind of living framework. So version one could be next year with the Summit of the Future, and we can maintain it after that. Thank you so much. Is this, yeah. Um, thank you very much. My name is Caitlin Chaffee. I'm a, a member of the coalition. I'd just like to say thank you very much to the, the Tech Envoy for joining us. I think it's a, a fantastic opportunity. There's been a lot of energy in the room tonight and a lot of, we've already picked up some new members. So I think it really shows the kind of importance and power of, of this coalition. And it, it seems to many of us, I think that this is a, a really pivotal moment um, with the lead up to the summit of the future, the launch of the safeguards initiative, you know, the critical point that we're at with the sustainable development goals. Um, and in this room, I think we have a lot of learning about the problems, the solutions, uh, where things can go wrong and where things can go right. And one of the themes of the beginning of the session was that as a coalition and as individual members, I think we're seeking to become more proactive in engaging in some of these multilateral processes, in some of the national level processes. And I think it would just be great to hear from you since we have you in the room today. Um, to hear a little bit about what you see the next six months looking like in this safeguards process, um, where will be the key opportunities to engage so that we as coalition members, as a group, can be prepared for them. And I think that the final question is really how do we ensure that the engagements go deeper than a kind of a unilateral consultation process, which I think is always something that civil society is keen to engage in. I think a lot of members here are very active in contributing inputs, but I think what we're really seeking here is a, a real exchange, you know, the opportunity to give feedback, receive feedback, um, and be more engaged in a truly participatory process. So how can we work together with you to make sure that that is a reality in the kind of next six months? That's, that's a great question. So we are currently in the process of putting together a governance structure for the initiative. So there'll be an advisory board, there'll be a steering committee, and also in the process of uh, putting together uh, a list of uh, learning partners, um, those who are, have been engaged on these issues, whether it's the Digital Public Goods Alliance, uh, DIAL, uh, the GovStack initiative, so that we can bring these players uh, from the DPI ecosystem into this uh, initiative and learn from their experiences. In terms of the engagement, the consultations uh, with civil society, also with the private sector, in some cases they may be the lead actors uh, in, uh, in developing uh, digital ID and other layers of uh, uh, DPIs if they are arranged in a stack. So we will develop a plan for engagement all the way up to the summit of the future where version one can be stood up uh, next to hopefully a good ambitious global digital compact so that this is a seen as a concrete manifestation of yes we want to advance on the SDGs by leveraging uh, DPIs but we want to do it responsibly in a human-centered, uh, human rights-respecting manner. But I do want to um, ask my colleague Moritz, who's into <laughs> the design of this initiative, check if he has anything to add. Thank you, Amandeep. Uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Moritz. I work uh, as an advisor on Amandeep's team. Uh, just referring to, you, to your question on how civil society can engage in the process, uh, we will have multiple convenings up to the Summit for the Future where we will um, collect input on the process. We are also planning to set up a, a platform where you can, um, co uh, where you can share, your ex share the experiences that you've made should you not have the possibility to um, engage in person during the convenings. Um, yeah, and we will be sharing updates on that process uh, 
yeah, in the next two months, I would say, something like this. And yeah, if you have uh, questions about that, feel free to reach out. Uh, we are looking forward to engage with you. Fantastic, thank you. We'll just see, do we have any other questions? We are having a conversation here. Yes, yes, behind. I think that microphone works. Oh, you, can, you can give him that one. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, good evening. Um, I was really asking myself, should I ask this question? Uh, but let me just ask. My name is Mustafa from Kenya. Um, in Kenya, for example, uh, UNDP signed an MOU with the government of Kenya without engagement, community engagement in terms of civil society, in terms of community, and without any policy in terms of launching a digital ID um, until the civil society were up in arms and all that. Uh, when the government was actually launching it in September, but it was pushed. So I was asking, um, at this level where there's already an existing MOU, um, how do we engage with the UNDP? Uh, because there's a, uh, there's a lot of risk of digitizing exclusion, because we are digitizing 5,000 services, and all of them are pegged to a digital ID. And in Kenya, there's no access, the accessibility of digital, uh, leave alone digital ID. The current ID system is less than 50% penetration level. And uh, now all 5,000 services, including health services, are going to be linked to a document that is not accessible. So how do you protect that um, the UN does not exacerbate um, exclusion? And it also promotes issues of accountability um, for example, the, this one, we don't even have a data protection impact assessment, leave alone a human rights uh, protection impact assessment. So how do we hold um, the UN accountable in that situation and also get to get information, right to information from the UN sector? Because in this sector, we don't clearly alienate you from government actor or civil society um, uh, uh, compatriot because we're like, which side do we put you? Are you part of the government now? Are you going to support civil society? Um, sorry, I don't want to, to look combative because um, that's the situation that you're in. You're just engaging. Yes, um, mm -hmm. and I'm very passionate because my community has been locked out of these systems for 100 years. Um, so seeing it, we look at it as digitizing marginalization. So how do we hold um, the institution accountable and even get information in terms of what are the lines of engagement with the government, what are the protections mechanisms that you have negotiated in terms of uh, on behalf of civil society and all that. I would love to interact more on that, but in case, I know my questions are ambiguous, but in case you pick any that you feel like you can address now, I really appreciate. Yeah, great uh, point, and uh, I have a very simple answer to that. Help us build it, so build it together with us, and help us maintain it so that we can all be held accountable. You know, if UN agencies are the ones who are kind of building out DPIs and uh, digital services on the ground, you can hold them accountable as per the safeguards uh, framework. Okay, so working together in community, right? Okay. Uh, just to add a bit to, the, to what the digital member of the Secretary General just said, um, the best thing a government can do is to develop their critical systems, their main systems, the central service system that sustain main public services or all public services should be using open source technology because open source technology help us to uh, not just to understand how things work but also Open, opens up the possibility for the technical communities from, the, from our same nations or other countries around the world to contribute and to see what we're building upon. It gave us the possibility to understand that most government systems can be safe, can be secure, and also develops trust. Especially in the, in the context where we're digitizing everything. And uh, in the context of digital ID, this is the, it's the same. So in order to prevent most of the situations that we, most countries are facing with their digital ID systems, an open source technology should be the, should be the base. And that's the, the thing that we've been doing in the DR. Great, so there's an experience to learn from there. Okay, any other comment, any other question? Okay, one more, and then we'll be wrapping up, okay. 
Um, just to respond on, there is, we've worked with um, UNDP, and one of the things that we were told, actually we had a very direct conversation was, kindly work with the government, because you've said, have a simple, we give you ideas on simple way to work, but in most cases when we give out these ideas, we are told you have a very good government, you can go and listen to them, but in real sense, the government doesn't listen to you. For instance, we were brought into a room to agree that we've decided to work together with government as civil societies. To an extent, there was a white paper that was provided. We did not know. To an extent, public participation, the government was saying they have done. It hasn't, it has not been done. So what room is there for us to really work with the UNDP and UN to be able to share this? Because there is platform, as you can say, but now having that conversation, it's not there. And also there is one uh, question that Brett asked that has not been answered. Um, there has been progresses. We cannot say that the government is really not doing so. For instance, through advocacy with in Kenya, we've seen some communities have been recognized as a community. They can be able to access these digital platforms. And also things like Data Protection Act, which weren't there, they're still there. So there are still opportunities that and we've seen. And your question? Yeah, I don't have a question. That was it, okay, yeah. okay. So I think what you, do you want to respond to? I think if you come to the event tomorrow, our colleagues from UNDP will be there. It's because I don't have the, you know, background to this white paper and the interaction with the government. So we can discuss it tomorrow. Exactly. The conversation will continue. And you said 9 what? 9.45? 9 a.m.? You can plug in 9 again? 9.45. 9.45? Where? C1. C1. Did we hear that? Huh? 9.45 where? C1. C1. Okay. An opportunity to continue the conversation. Can you imagine? The conversations don't just end here. They continue. They continue online. Oh, my goodness. Oh, this community. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments? Any other questions? Okay. I think I can wrap up. Anything? Four minutes? We have four minutes. Okay. Yes. It seems you're joining the community. By the way, members, can you put up your hands so that if people want more information, you know who to talk to? Okay, fantastic. Uh, I don't have a question. I just want to make a, a statement that, you know, uh, I'm from India, and India is always glorified with our DPI structure as, like, the outstanding model and it's going to push your economy to blah, blah, blah levels, and you know, you're going to gain like trillions of dollars, and et cetera, et cetera. But I think there is a lot of myth that surrounds. And uh, I think, I think uh, that, that's the reason why I want to join the community, because you know, to address the myth before even thinking about starting this kind of an infrastructure in your country, because you should ask whether you need it or not, and are you going to face the problems that India suffered? Because India suffered massively because it started when I, was, when I was studying law, and now I'm in the position where I'm researching in this kind of structure. So I've, I've, I myself have seen that you know, it, had, it had its own problems, and you need to work it out. I guess that's it for me. Thank you. All right. OK. You can also ask her about the community. <laughs> OK. Any other comments? Any other questions? Can I wrap up now? Yeah? Okay, okay, thank you all so very much for being part of this conversation. The conversation continues. Please get the one pager if you want to get to know any other information about what the community does. Please enjoy the rest of your evening, the rest of your day. Asante sana. Yeah, and I mean, happy to have you.